Chief Creative Officer of, of, of the Communication Group, Joe Public, Public United, United, who lives for creativity that deeply connects with people. His passion is to co-create an environment and culture that breeds exponential growth. The growth of Joe Public's clients, people, and ultimately our country. Moved by the obvious gap in our system and a driving need to give back as well as actively grow our country, he established the Joe Public CSR program once committed time in 2014. This association with the single-minded vision of creating an educational system that is a shining example to the world. He is a recipient of numerous local and international industrial awards and has sat on creative boards, judging panels from the Executive Committee of the Creative Circle to CAN and has it was awarded the Agency Leaders of the Year 2013. According to Pepe, accolades are merely the building blocks towards a vision of creating an environment that inspires greatness. We welcome him and we'd like to encourage him, encourage us all to take ownership to become leaders of our own immediate environment. That is what his talk is on today. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, so, so thank you and I'm honoured for the invitation and in advertising we get a brief and we normally don't follow the briefs. So towards the end of my slides I try to sort of take it to that point of the subject matter. Um, just, just to be fair, I always get all these sort of nice things said about me and like he's done all this and that and that. And so Bronwyn's also joining me. Bronwyn's actually the managing director of One Split of Time. And she finally was with me and it's, it's an endeavor we've been um, engaging with for 10 years. I'll be at the moment. I'm 100% in my business because as we know, the country is very tough. It's, it's my view that the world's upside down. Um, you know, bottom line become the most important thing. I always thought bottom line is at the bottom, so it should be the last thing in your mind. You should be worrying about other things. I think my my core thing, my core reason for being is probably the growth of people. Um, and whether I was an advertising expert or a lawyer or an educator, I always looked at that purpose. Um, I had a beautiful puzzle slide. It's just as simple as this is what happens when you finish your presentation at one o'clock in the morning. You should plan better. <laughs> Especially if you know a year in advance and you've been invited. But the other thing I do believe is that when you work from your instinct, you actually come from a far purer place than from your head. I want to start with a story. I don't know. Has anyone climbed Kilimanjaro? Speak up. I'll speak up. Can you, can you hear the back? Good, good. You, you've climbed Kilimanjaro. Magnificent experience. Not a walk in the park. Maybe the first couple of days. So I was invited to a business dinner um, in 2010. And at that stage of my business career, we were bankrupt. We were just coming out of physically being bankrupt, um, having tanked in that 2008-2009 recession. So I was in a quite insecure space and I was surrounded by very successful Johannesburg entrepreneurs and I remember the seat next to me was, was vacant and the person was, was running late and when he eventually arrived his name was Lee Kilimonde, he was an ex um, MK fighter and uh, it's quite high up in, in the corporate world in South Africa and he was very flamboyant and I was saying I'm climbing Kilimanjaro, who wants to go with? And what I've learned through dealing with insecurity in the corporate world and in my personal life, you know, because we get so much put on our shoulders that we're not designed to, to actually cope with. And it's all inside ourselves. On the outside we look so, so confident, but from the inside we literally, I mean, you might not feel that confident. So I learned to step into things. See, you don't even wait a second for your head to start. I just want to go with. And I found myself suddenly practicing with the climb Kilimanjaro for three weeks and then we were climbing, I took my wife with 
And for the first time in my social life, I was in a minority because everyone in my party was Zulu. So they're all speaking Zulu, Kikile and Kanye and Vincent Chani and then I'm very good friends with the Sibu Sisi Bolani who's climbed the Everest before so I got him to take us up. And so it was an amazing experience but the thing that stood out was just at the top of, I can't remember, it's a steep cliff, I think it's called Bronco Wall. There's a cap and we arrived at the cap at 11 o'clock the next morning, I think day 4 or 5. At minus 10 degrees and you're the clouds. And we were all huddled in this little tent. And now we had the whole day to kill together. And I remember Kanye said to me, Pepe, and these were her exact words, Pepe, I would like you, this is something before that, I'm now the only white guy in a group of Zulus and, and I think one course of this. So, 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 so she said, I want you to tell us your story, your life story, in the way you want us to know you. I said, I'm not doing that. And then she asked again, and then I spent the next hour uninterrupted once, just telling my entire white life story the way I wanted them to know me. And then each person took turns to tell their life story. And it was more profound than summiting um, Kilimanjaro, much more. The, the thing that I remember was that sharing experience of eight hours where each person actually shared their life story and we saw throughout diversity how we are exactly the same. And how each person has very interesting life stories and very interesting backgrounds to them. So I'm not going to share my entire life story. But what I did think, just to create context, and then I think the timekeeper, maybe just give me like an indication, because I didn't time this, because if I timed this, I would have got to be at two. If, if it was an hour, maybe three. <laughs> so, so I'm going to share you my life story, and I didn't slide, whatever, whatever thought came up, I went to Google, and then I found a picture. So the first thought, I was born on Guy Fox. Guy Fox. 5 November 1968, so I, I entered the world, I would say, with an unceremonious bang. I was very sort of unassuming. Um, the next thing that came up, I wasn't conscious of it right in that moment. I was brought into a very, very um, a home where alcohol was a huge problem on my father's side. And then seeing a mother that had to deal with so, so, so he was an alcoholic, my mother was a teacher. So I think there's maybe a sort of a synergy why I'm passionate about it. Um, education. My first visual, my first sort of thing I can recall, and I think I must have been about three months old. I checked this with my mum. There's a black toilet seat, she was sitting on the toilet, and I remember the tiles was black and white. She couldn't believe me when I asked about this because our first flat that they lived in at that stage had black and white floor and a black toilet seat. And I remember she looked like an angel because I was looking up from the floor and the sun was coming through me from behind. That's my first, first visual. The next one is Terrible, but I'm going to share it. The next one I recall as vividly as that one is my father trying to kill us. So he was like, just when he got into his rage, he was crazy. And I'm not saying that to provoke a shock because I, I realized working with um, some sort of more mass market South Africa, dealing with schools, this is nothing in comparison to nine out of ten people in South Africa. So I don't think this is so hectic, it's something that happened. But it's, but it's things that sort of started imprinted into my mind. I was about three years old. Um, that carried on for many years, and I think because I was surrounded by children in a, in a sort of upper class government school, that it means to end more means than I did. I started working at the age of 12. That's so I started delivering newspapers. I always thought this is so profound because my entrepreneurial spirit was probably born here. And when I look at South Africa and I look where people come from, I think it's the perfect potential for entrepreneurial spirit. Because people have nothing. And it seems through my career, uh, meeting more and more entrepreneurs, there's more and more stories of people coming from nothing, creating something. And where a lot of people think it might be negative, it's quite a positive. So that's the next thing that came up. And then there's a huge jump. I think my mother divorced my father three years after this. So I grew up from 14 to adulthood with 
my brother and his two sisters, which, which I think is a privilege because I've got a lot more um, compassion, I think, for, for women, speaking about women. I love, I love using this one. I have used this before, so I hope this just come into this last part. But, but this is my first girlfriend, and I always say that that's me on the other side. <laughs> the guy with the, with the tongue hanging out. I was very hairy then, so it's my little joke, but I was in love. I followed this woman around from the age of seven, seven so grade nine, and we only hooked up in grade 11, in the grade 11. So, so to, to me, it was sort of, it showed that if you put your mind to something, and you visualize something, it can come to life. And she then broke up with me at the end of matric, and broke my heart because I went to the army. So, so and I made a little joke about it. I fought for the safety of my girlfriend and her boyfriend. And I didn't even know what I was fighting for. So if you speak about leadership, I don't think you're born a leader. Um, I think I'm a very good leader today. I think I'm a long way from where I want to be as a leader. And I think there's so much growth to be done. If I look at leadership in the world, I think it's lacking. I think where people are coming from is not right. But then again, I can only fix myself. So I daily strive to improve how I lead together with my partners, our business, how I lead my household, how I lead myself. I think that's also something we, we misunderstand. We think you have to be in a position to be a leader. We forget that you can lead yourself. It actually starts with that. So I wasn't a very good leader. I became an officer. But I became an officer to make more money. So I was pretty much on point. I wanted to make a lot of money. Um, the amazing thing is I saw the opportunity, so that's me with a beard and a long hair. I was like a Keith Richards of South Africa. There's not much I didn't do, so as Keith would say. I mean, I was just quoting Keith. But um, what happened in the army, I had time available to me, and the, the man my girlfriend left me for could play guitar. So I thought, I'm going to learn to play guitar, because then I'll be able to get my girlfriend back. So I spent two years of my army, I was in a goal of making extra money, and I was learning every spare second of the day, I was learning how to play guitar. What I thought was, is for 16 years I then played music in the different bands on various size stages, anything from two people, which would be my girlfriend and a friend, to 2,000 people, which is spectacular. I mean, to, to be able to make music, original music, and get a response from a massive amount of people is so good for your ego, if you still have a big ego. Um, and then, I, of course, I got the girlfriend back. So we then got married. So the girl is the one on the right. And the other girl is me. So, so. And then back to the army, an interesting thing happened. I wanted to become a civil engineer because civil engineers make money. So you can see, you grow up poor, you're going to be rich. That's kind of the way the mind, the logical mind figure things out. Um, and it's not necessarily the right way. So engineering, one of my friend's father was an engineer with money. I want to become an engineer. I was sitting on my last day in the army waiting for what they call a flossy, the C-130 Hercules. And there was a guy with a portfolio, and he was a graphic designer. And I thought, this just moved me. So I didn't even think with my head. I just went with my gut said, this is what I want to do. And I gave up my R4 rifle for 4B pencil. So, so, so but, but truly tr 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 so, and I, I, I never, I, I drew a little bit at school, I actually got uh, my girlfriend, I hooked her by drawing a beautiful picture on an egg, so, so I could draw. And, and as, uh, this is not my saying, I can say it's mine, the pencil is my it's the sword. I kind of bend it a bit, but the pencil turns out to be far mightier than the gun. Um, and, and art has done phenomenal things for me, because at that stage of my life, I was super insecure. Because at school I found the system, um, and it's just my own experience of school. So some people experience it very in a, in a good way. I found the measurement system was breaking my self-confidence. I felt like being a D performer. I got an A for maths, high grade. I did my rest of my subjects, standard grade, except for Afrikaans. 
I found this the, the, the grading made me feel not good enough. Um, um, I like to find different answers to the questions, um, and it was also always supposed to just be one answer. So, and I, and I wasn't good at sport because I wasn't built for rugby. Um, as an well, Afrikaner in a school of Afrikaans people, you gotta go and play rugby. Um, so I find that the pencil gave me self-confidence and it gave me a higher self-esteem. And it gave me the self-belief to start writing my own future. Um, which, which I find interesting, that just finding something that you're passionate about and, and something that you're really good at, how that can build your self-esteem and suddenly you become good at sport, something you assume you're never good at. So I started performing in various sports because now I'm suddenly a rock star in the band and game. And, and I had this notion of having my own business by the age of 30. So this was a, a predetermined plan I put in place at the age of 20 when I realized I'm really, really good at my art, at my craft. And I think based on having worked my entire life from the age of 12 for my own income, that I was going to do my own business. The first jobs that I worked for, I was probably the hardest person, the hardest working person in, in town. And I think it's based on my mother's resilience. So I picked up her way of being. She was the hardest working person I ever knew. Um, what's this? I drowned in 1995. I physically drowned. I remember at that stage I wasn't going to church. And when you've... And it's interesting. I, th I think even an atheist finds God if they see they're going to die. I wasn't an atheist. I was brought up Christian. But in that moment of going, this is going the wrong way, I am going to drown. Because I was concussed, I was trapped under the Dolosa, I was paddle skiing, I was washed by massive waves into the breakwaters, and I drowned. I prayed to God, God didn't come and save me. So I thought, and then I made peace with it. And I remember seeing the vision of my girlfriend, who's now my wife, going to the front door. And she opened the door and there was a policeman there. And, and my, that vision to me quickly said that she's not being told that I'm dead and I'm at peace that I'm dying. And the feeling of relief was incredible. So at 25, to realize there's so much pressure on you as a human being was, was incredible. I didn't have children. I wasn't married yet. I was my first house. I had a little job. I didn't have my own business. But the relief of the pressure of the world going off my shoulders when I thought I'm dead was incredible. It's something I'm always looking forward to one day when I move on, but I don't want to really die right now. But, but, but I, I, it was an incredible feeling. Um, this, this is the couch on which we conceived the idea for our business. <laughs> it stands in my office. <laughs> to, to this day, it's there. It, it looks a bit tired, but it's not. It's like me. It's ready for the second chapter. It's next 50 years. Bring it on. I need a business partner because I'm a creative guy, which is weird that you think because you're creative you're not business minded. So you did a creative guy, oh, no, I need a business partner. I'm blessed with an incredible business partner. I'm meeting the first night. I've been shooting commercials and um, till all the hours. I think I'm, I've got a bit of a call. So I meet my business partner for the first time in my life in 1998. This is a surfer from Cape Town. We don't know we're going to have a business yet, but he's been proposed to me by a friend of ours as the perfect guy to be my business partner. And being a surfer, I tell him that I'm a paddle skier. And he then goes, hey, that's just terrible, because the surfers don't like paddle skiers. And he then says, there was this idiot paddle skier a few years back at the Mopalai, we paddle skied and went into the door so, and, and drowned. And, and then he and his friend were surfing and he said to his friend, we've got to help this guy. And his friend apparently said, I gave him his boatman, just leave him. And he said, no, that baby's going to die. And apparently, he said he went and went under the water and took this person out and saved his life. So that person was me. So based on the story, I, I sat and I thought, that is incredible. Because I never knew there was a human intervention. When I came to, I was on a, a roll of pipes, 
for floating in the, in the more quiet water and that's so I came and picked me up. So, so he then told me, he took me out, put me on the pipes, swam out, found the NSRI, found the ambulance. So based on that story, we just on the spot decided to resign and we started our business. So, so that was like a truly true true profound moment of my life. That's, that's the two of us. That's, that's our first little office where we started our business in 1998. And we brought takeaway advertising into South Africa, so we put everything on a menu. It, it looked like a little diamond, people could buy advertising off, off the menu. That's, that's my first business card. I called myself a head creator chef. People would come in and ask for cakes. We said, no, we make ads. Please get out. So, so, kind of confusing concept, but it revolutionized advertising. It was a different way of being transparent about your costing model. And we today have an agency in Amsterdam that runs off the exact model. We sold the business prematurely. 2001 with a vision to expand all over the world. Um, it, it never happened. And, and for eight, eight years, we belonged to an American company 100%. And it was really a dark time of my business career because we couldn't do anything. If someone wanted a new computer, you had to get approval. Anything over 5,000 Rand, you have to get approval. You cannot move in a business like that. And it, it just didn't work. And a few years before the recession, I went into a personal recession in 2006. I retrenched a very senior person for being a racist. I thought it was the right thing to do. He then went and worked for our biggest client, became the marketing director and fired us. And we lost half our business overnight, which wasn't really our business. So, so it was just interesting how things were going phenomenally wrong in my life. My relationship with my wife was falling apart. My business was falling apart. It wasn't even my business. There was just a whole lot of things going wrong. And I remember at that stage I was reading a book, Good to Great, by John Collins. And it spoke about the brutal truth. So I thought, well, let me look at the brutal truth of my life. And, and I did a gut for sort of just a feeding on it. And I realized my health wasn't too, too, too good. I was, I was working hard. I'm very talented. I work hard, but I also party hard. I used to. So my health wasn't really good. So if I had to give myself out of 100 health, 40%. My family life was falling about 40%. The business wasn't mine. It just, just hanged. This was before we actually went bankrupt. We cut it in half. Financially, I've always wanted to make money, I wasn't making money. And then I had a little CSI thing called Rock for AIDS, which Brandon did with me. Which the intention was more just to play music in front of people for my own ego's sake. And then if I made 10,000 rand, we donated to the AIDS orphanage and pretend to feel good about myself. So, so as I looked at that picture, I said, geez, that's not a good picture. Um, Interesting on this picture is I'm a, I'm a high performing individual. So I suppose my mathematical mindset is it wasn't possible that, that a talented person can, can put in 80%, maybe even 90%, um, and, and get an output in life of 40. It doesn't, it doesn't add up. It's almost like your education, if your class results 40%, and I don't know if it completely aligns to 100% true input. Um, that's, that's kind of how my mind works and makes these assumptions not necessarily true. So, so I went on a massive journey of inner self-discovery. And, and I think I stumbled across what could have been, I think today my mind, I believe this is true. And, and that's what I love about life. If there's no truth, because what I believe in was what someone else believed might be completely opposite. But this is my belief. And I was given the biggest gift, like available to the Egyptian mankind. It was a massive gift, and um, I planted this gift into my life. And, and the thing that happened was, it's spectacularly recovered. So, 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 so I'm not going here from 10 to 100. If I measure things, if I just take the CSI project, the CSI in one year on the same effort went from 10,000 rand money raised net to 110,000 in next year to a million rand in next year. And I thought, just that's profound. And on a business level, the same thing happened. And on my personal life, thing, the same thing happened. So the recovery of my life was spectacular. It was huge. Um, 
And, and it is all because of these kids. So this is our business today. And if I am I'm very proud of it, it's this down the road, it's this maze. Um, it's, it's unwillingly called the Red Cross's main road. And, and it employs 260 people, and it's in growth, it's going mad, it's going 30% in the last six months in this, in this economy. And, and it's because you plant the same gift into the building, into the business. Um, and I'm, I'm actually going to sound proud, I'm not really proud, I'm grateful for this business because the things it allows us to do. It allowed us to, to, to do a bit more with our non-profit once a bit of time, um, as, as much as even possible at the scale of the business, and hopefully long term and much more, because we, we have a 25 year plan, which is 8 years in. So I want to chat about, about the gift. And I think if I could time for my, my, my presentation or slides have disappeared, it would have been leadership in one word. If I had to sum up leadership in one word, I mean, I can write a book on leadership and my sort of learnings. I think this is the crux to, 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 to what I think could be profound leadership that could make a big change in the world. Um, some, some call it life purpose. You know, there's a lot to talk about life purpose. Like what's your purpose in life? Why do you exist? And, and few people might know the answer. I find the purpose word is a little bit, um, it, it, it scares people, it sounds too meaningful, and it seems in life people don't want to be that meaningful. I just want to get through my day, get to the weekend, hey, it's Friday, have a party, or just relax, and start my day again. So I call it life strategy. And, 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 and I think why is this methodology, which is the insight I gathered on a transformational workshop. I'm a workshop junkie. I go all over the world for workshops. And I love new learning. I love new intelligence. None of these ideas are mine. Some of them are repackaged, rehashed. Some things come out of the ether. I literally I'll share one just now where the idea came out of the blue, which I think is a great sort of consciousness, like a godlike idea that comes into the human mind, which, which I know is not my idea, because it's to be in my mind, it's too profound to be in my own mind's idea. But, but I'm, I'm a marketing specialist. 27 years experience, I've been dealing with high-level, massive brand strategies for the last decade. My, our key, key, key clients is a business net bank, Anglo-American, um, like really big blue chip brands, global South Africa. So you deal with high-level executives at a high strategic level. And, 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 and I'm amazed by the fact that there's so little clarity around what the business stands for. So if I look at all the brands in the world, according to my methodology, Toyota is the only one, and Volvo, funny that they're both are cars. Where if I to sum up the purpose of those brands in one word, Volvo will say safety, and Toyota is reliability. If I go out and ask, Seek a bit deeper, I might find Nike's inspiration. If I look through their websites, their communication, and what they try to inspire all people can can be athletes, even if you're not an athlete. So, so this notion of this one word, and I thought it's so interesting that we do these things for brands and it does create sustainable brands. But we don't have it for life, for our personal lives. If you ask someone what's your 25 year plan, most people won't know. I saw, I was on a, 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 a talk um, at the Trackers conference about seven years ago where one of the motivational speakers asked the CEO, what, do you, what does your brand stand for? He didn't know. And, and how is your 800 people supposed to know what you stand for? So, so I came up with this as a methodology, which I find interesting. Um, I'll put it in a nutshell. I think we're obsessed with humanness in this world. So, so we get given our human name by our parents, and depending on what religion or what context you're born into, that all influences who you are as a person. It's, it's a human name, it's all about what you do in your life, what you become. It's, it's about the material, it's where you live, what you drive, even your belief, they say it's your set of beliefs. And, and what I find, it's, it's, it comes from quite a high level of self-service. And I don't, I don't think it's wrong to serve yourself because I think you need to be able to sustain yourself. But, but when, when I mathematically looked at it, I thought, well, that's, well, that's potentially only 50% of the game. 
and, and if you uh, if 80 percent performing person like myself and you and only living on the human side of life then your output would be 40 percent that's kind of my logic came up to this as a thought but we forget that we're actually human beings and, and the interesting thing is on the being side there is another name for each human on this planet there is another name that you are born into this world that's given to you by God that's, that's just not uncovered and so there's no clarity around it and, and I often think even, even a tree a tree has been given its name as a human name it's a tree I don't even know what that means but the being name of a tree could be life or you know, because it makes oxygen or shelter and, and if we, we understand that the trees actually exist for that purpose maybe we won't cut it down so easily but it's just a tree we use it for fire and the being side is more about what what your greater cause in this world is and serving of others and, and immediately when i introduced that notion of serving others authentically into my life I made available to me another 50%. But, but then when I saw the returns being so much more than just 50%, I started to interrogate it more. I was like, this doesn't make sense, because I think it should be 50-50. So, so if I just had to look at finances, if I made 10 rand, I should now make 20 rand. But suddenly I'm making 2,000 rand. Because it's just exponential going crazy. And suddenly I see the truth that the more you give, the more you get, as long as you give, not to get. When you, when you come from that sort of pure <coughs> place of the unconscious, then it seems the universe just gives back. Ooh, I'm wrong. Don't try to plug in. I'm just. Pass my time. So, so, so what wasn't aligning with my methodology then was this is making sense based on that I'm a 40% person but now my return in my life is so spectacular for the same effort and all I've changed is just serving people. I just want to serve people authentically. I want to bring out the best in those around me and stop, stop drinking because I'm working with youth. And I heard this beautiful story about Gandhi and I go, I can't work with youth and sort of try and Influence them, influence them not to drink. If I drink, so I stopped drinking alcohol 10 years ago. So I did a lot of things. I cut my hair. I tried to be, like, I just tried to be the best I can be to influence the people I work with. And, and I'm quite black and white, so now I can't have just one glass of wine. So, so I come across this as an insight. Roughly. Roughly. First, there's this talk about we only use 2% of our total mind. So there's the conscious, so there's the conscious and there's the unconscious. Now, I'm also, I'm, I'm, also, I'm, I'm using the brain just as a, as a visual representation. But I've got a notion that the unconscious mind is actually everything below the head. I'm not an expert, no, I'm not an expert in this, it's just kind of the things I'm figuring out in my head. Because when my girlfriend broke my heart, I didn't get a headache, so, so I actually got a heartache, and, and, and when, when, I, when, I, when I'm nervous, so, so, so I was slightly nervous being even in front of you guys, but I'm still a lot of in front, but I'm always a bit nervous, but I don't get butterflies between my ears, I get, I get butterflies in my tummy, and then when I, when I meet my wife, I don't, I go, yeah, I don't get my head up. I wonder if she can cook well, I know that's very successful. I wonder if she can cook well, I wonder if she can cook well, and then tick boxes. You just, it's just a deeper, massive, weird thing that goes down. And that's what I call the unconscious. And that's what I call the unconscious. So I Googled this to double check the fact. The conscious mind, the one that you're using to listen to me on, the one that we used to learn with, the one that we put all our beliefs on, only processes at 2,000 bits per second. And the unconscious mind at 400 billion bits per second. So your greater consciousness, your greater wisdom, the things that we use, like we struggle to sell 
some amazing ideas to our clients because they're so in their heads that when they react to it, then five minutes later they start thinking about it and they start picking it apart. Because we've given up our real wisdom for what we think our wisdom is. And I find it so interesting. And I find it so interesting. I think Jesus must be truth. Because if I then take the brain, this little mathematical sum, and I turn the human being on the side, and I go, okay, so the human is, is this conscious mind that we've been given what we should think, what we should believe, and all these things. But the being, the God within each of us is the greater consciousness. And if that is actually true, just on a 2% 98%, then we're actually each living a percentage of 2% of our true potential. So if you're a 100% person, you are living 100% of 2%. And 98% being. And then I thought, mm, but that's 2,000 versus 400 billion. Then maybe that sum should then maybe that sum should look more like this. That each of us right now are living, if we are working really the best of our ability, a percentage of 0.8 noughts and a five percent of our true potential. And I go cheese, we said that like a time bomb because the human race is so spectacularly poised for greatness. And how can we unlock that? So, so, I've, shifted so, so I've shifted it from 50 50 because now it's starting to make sense to me. I'm not yet at the bottom lane in terms of what I'm getting back in life, but it doesn't really matter what I get back anymore. I'm just kind of going for it to see what happens. But it's kind of saying it's not 50 50. It's not 298. It's actually that potential. So, so my hypothesis is, is what's well, actually my belief. I mean, I'm waiting for a brain for you to take me on in it, and I won't believe him. I'll just go away because I think this is a thought that came from a superpower. So I'm not going to believe any human is going to take me up on it. But if you can find your being that that one word, that one word that you were born to be, then it will transform. Then it will transform your life, but like radically. And of course it takes disciplines because we live in this highway of life and now you have to be in a straight and narrow. And I know it's like faith. It's faith. It's faith. But, but it's not just believing in God because I think it puts quite a lot of onus on God. It's actually finding your own strategy to live towards that potential that's been giving to each of us. And I then thought, but why could this possibly be true? And when I was interrogating this, this is an idea that came out of me. The blue. I was driving behind the design quarter, and when the unconscious mind, when the unconscious mind gives you an idea, it gives you a picture, because the conscious mind is taught a language, and then the unconscious mind thinks of pictures, which is when you say you look, which is when you say you look canary, people think you look canary in a picture, and in a microsecond, 2,000 bits per second speed, later you think you look canary, and this idea came left out of the blue into my head, and I felt as it dropped down, and it was this picture of the earth. And the words that came with it, well, Afrikaans, came in English. And the words said, if there is a God, if there is a God, so it didn't say there is a God or there isn't, it just said, if there is a God, and God created the world and everything in it, and we are created in the image of God, what is our creative power? And I said, Jesus, that's interesting, because as a person, I might create like a house and a car and clothes, and I've got a job, and I maybe give a little bit back, and I've got a little business. But if I'm in the image of God, and God created the entire world, that's quite minuscule by comparison, which then to me starts shame and dreams and potential, because we, we create children, and God creates man on the seventh day. So, I mean, there's, there's evidence that we are from the same being. The being, not the human side, but the spiritual side, because God is not a human. And then I started thinking, what's and then I started thinking, what's holding us back? Because I've got this little boy, he's nine years now, and when you, see, when you see them, they're so perfect. They come into the world so perfect, absolute magnificent perfection. And the unconscious mind is what they're born with. And then apparently the conscious mind only fully forms. It starts forming, but it's only fully formed after six. Because you don't want to. Because you don't want to have reason when you say. Don't do this. You must just take it. Don't argue yet. Don't argue yet. Start arguing after six ish. But they start arguing like But they start arguing like a three, four, and they keep on developing. I think seven. I think seven. They start finding a new dimension. But the interesting thing is, 
a year no can't and done 48,000 times. So I was just questioning what happens between that point and adulthood or that time in life. So I've found my turning point in my life for 38, I'm 48 and 49 this year. So my last 10 years is what I've dealt with, with more spiritual side of life. But the child is on average 48,000 on no, can't and don't, and only 5,000 yes and you can. So they already conditioned in their unconscious mind, the 400 billion bits per second mind, that they can't. And then the conscious mind can say, yes you can, but the unconscious mind says, no you can't. We never, and we never manifest what we should because we precondition. And I've worked in many ways to unlock this and to kind of cross, get rid of all the crosses. Or for instance, we teach children, as an example, that one plus one apple is two apples, which is not true because you can cut an apple open and plant the seeds and you have like millions of different answers. This is why I thought with the school system because I said, but it's not true, sir. It's going to well, go and get another ID because you're not just disrupted. And I know it's freaking me out because it's not true. It's not one plus one. And also one plus one could be eleven. Because two ones next to each other is eleven. I mean it's not two. So, so then we get that system on top of the that first and by the time we get out of the system, we we are not conditioned to think at the level we should be thinking anymore. So it almost feels so it almost feels like we we this iron and then we get forged over this anvil by life. So so, so I'm asking, do you need to be forged by life, and do you need to be beaten into finding a greater purpose? You know, I go like, do you, do you really need to go to hell and back, lose someone in life to find a greater cause? Sit in like nothing, go bankrupt, lose your wife to find a greater purpose? Is there no way that one can actually systematically like bring it into education, and hence my passion for starting small? And thinking long term and thinking, is it possible to kind of just start relooking the curriculum um, from a broader sense of view? Every single person, and I'll speak about wealth just now, every single person that I know in my life that's worth more than 200 million rand, which in dollars is not that much, and it's a crap load of money, every single one of them comes from nothing. Most of them have not got profound educational skills. They've just got high levels of logic, almost simplicity. Um, and I think, and I think, I think things are not. I think things are not changing as fast as they could be changing, and, and, and it must be possible to be able to empower someone with a strategy for their life at the school level, which will influence what they choose to become massively. And if you do that, and if you do that, you assist people to become leaders rather than followers. Because I also look at the world we live in. I mean, I know that our entrepreneurs in South Africa has gone down from 10 percent to 6 percent of adult population. Uganda is sitting at 3 percent. Uganda has got 30 percent entrepreneurs that sit at 3 percent unemployment. So the only way to close the gap is to create more more that level of thinking and not people to think that this fit into a system where they must do what the man or fast becoming the woman says and create victors rather, and create victors rather than victims give us rather than take us and I, it's a bit harsh and, but i'm very hard on myself as well but i just think we're not thinking big enough as as, as people and i believe the purpose is the gift that allows you to take ownership it's too far. It was me trying to quickly bring it back to the group. But I do believe that purpose is the gift that allows you to take ownership of, of your life. Um, and of, of your craft. And of, of your craft. I really do believe, it, really do believe it. It's, it is profound how much focus it gives me every day in my life. Every single thing that I do, I line behind my life to everything. And everything becomes far more clear, far more crystal. And it is... And it is fundamental to progress, in my view. And it develops IQ, and it develops IQ EQ, SQ and RQ. So, so my experience um, is that there's too much IQ in the world, there's too much logic. I found at the age of about 42 that I was emotionally 25. Actually, in my behavior, in the way I behave, 
thoughts in my mind, so I used to throw things and that in my way. And when I became honest about it, I realized I'm 17 years behind my actual age. And that's just because as boys, we're not allowed to cry. You know, the famous words my parents, my dad said to me, is raise my face and slip your trauma. So, 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 so you're not allowed to cry, so you, you grow up and you're not able to show your emotion as a man. And I think that's why we don't relate properly to women. But if you find purpose in your life, it will develop your EQ, your spiritual intelligence, and also your resilience. And that's something that's massively needed to be taught at a school level, is that it's not just about the, uh, the academic side. I think the academic is important. I love mathematics. I love language. Um, and whatever you've got a passion for, but I think there's a huge gap for emotional intelligence, spiritual intelligence, and resilience. It unlocks, it unlocks all eight forms of wealth. This is so amazing that as people we might be aware of two forms of wealth. Um, it's a learning I gathered in, uh, in Canada and, and when it was presented to me, I just got it. Because one of my mentors is the seventh wealth. I wouldn't say it's a mentor, mentor, but I spent a lot of time with this man flying in his private plane. And I learned a lot from him. And he's not happy. And he's not happy. He's never been happier. He's never been happier. I've never experienced Even when his child was still alive, we lost. And his wife was alive, we lost. He's a billionaire and he's not happy. And I couldn't figure out how not. But when I heard about this, that the number one form of wealth is your spiritual wealth. How, 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 how well developed, how rich are you in your spiritual life? Number two, number two is your family. No, number two is your health. Like, I, really believe we are I really believe we are learning from God for this lifetime. It's like a book. You give it back when you finish it at the end of your life. How well do we look after a book? That's mouth. Number three is family. Number four is craft. How much do you love and How much do you love and have passion for what you do? And these are things we're not teaching kids. I'm talking now out of school because I haven't been in school for 30 years. But in my experience working with government schools, it's not yes, maybe in private schools. And yes, maybe in private schools there's more awareness of it, but that's only 5% of South Africa. The rest of the schools are government schools. So we're setting up like a 95% dysfunctional population through the school system because it's a great system, because you can really you can force things through that system with a good intention. Outside of school system, there's not another time that you can force with the right intention. Um, the five words. Four is um, craft. Your craft, like really finding passion. I'm teaching my son to work hard. I told him I'm, 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 I'm teaching my son to work hard. I'm teaching him to find his passion. And then he'll actually never work in his life again because he'll just love what he does. Number five is money. It's the fifth form of wealth is money. Number six is your circle of influence, the people you attract, if all those others are aligned. Because if you just love money, you're going to just attract people that will be obsessed about money with no souls. But if you're obsessed about spiritual, family, health, it's amazing how your circle of things change. Your circle of influence changes. Number seven is adventure. So yes, there has to be joy in the world. It's not all serious and let's save the world. There has to be spectacular travel. Experiencing things. Adventure. Adventure might be just having a dinner with someone who makes you feel uncomfortable. And then number eight, and then number eight is giving back. Right at the bottom of lining those eight. And I've put that into my life as well. I thought, geez, I'd love to be that wealthy one day. Um, and I'm working towards that, which is quite a journey. And then just in complex, in, in, in sort of closure, I wasn't completely aware of my audience. I knew it to do with education. So these are just thoughts. Thoughts that if you find value in it, you can share with whoever children in your life. These are things that really I find valuable. The literary party party shots. This one is one that has changed my life so much and helped me to deal with so much. And I, I learned it from my experience with my girlfriend 30 years ago that the worst thing that can happen in life is the best thing. I haven't experienced death close enough. I, I eventually lost my father, but it didn't touch me as much. So I can't speak about it in the context of death. But in everything else, when we lost half our business, it gave us the opportunity to buy our business back. Every single time something bad happens, there's such a miracle behind that. 
experience. So this is just, this is, I would say that's one of my favorite uh, mantras that I live by. Knowledge is not power. Knowledge is not power. Is my other one. It's, it's really, it's, it's, the it's really the biggest lie. And the reason why I think, and the reason why I think that is I smoked for 18 years, and there's the knowledge on every single cigarette box. It says smoking kills. Smoking clogs the arteries and causes heart attacks and strokes. So that's knowledge in my mind. But it's only when you act upon knowledge that it becomes powerful. So, so again, I find that that's, that's something we're lacking in the world. There's a lot of talk. Action and we call it in process. And I look at governments across the globe, not just South Africa, where people literally sleep their lives away and nothing moves forward. And all the talk is there, all the knowledge is there, but there's no action. So the application of knowledge is power. And that's why I'm such a hungry for workshops and stuff, junkie, because I love applying the discipline with discipline things into my life and then see what it can do for me. This is my all time and then this is my all time favorite. The last one. This is I promise, this is genius. I promise you it's genius. It's not my idea so I can say it. It was given to me by, it was given to me by a very uh, my clock. I think many business coaches as you should when you create a business because you don't know what now you're doing. And um, at this stage was and at this stage was in two thousand nine when we lost we were bankrupt the bridge, mm -hmm. and as the breadwinner mm -hmm. um, in my house, I felt I felt I felt I felt I felt my family. Felt, I felt, I felt my family. So, now I'm, so now I'm dealing with that internally. I'm going to can to judge can to, can to judge can. So this is a huge so this is a huge prestigious outside. thing. So from the outside, it's like so amazing what, amazing what these guys are doing. From the inside, I don't have money. I, I don't have money to fly to Cape Town for my sister's birthday. But I'm not telling my family I'm saying I'm too busy. Because I'm too embarrassed. So I'm, very so I'm very secure on the inside. But I'm putting on a brave face. And he gave me, and this, he insight. Gave me this insight. I, can't I, think exactly I can't remember exactly where it came from. He said, in, in the morning, when you, teeth, when you brush your teeth, look yourself in the eyes, look yourself in the eyes and, yourself in the and tell yourself that you are absolutely amazing, that you are great, that you love yourself. So I started doing that, so I started doing that in 2009, June. I've done, I've done it seven days a week. I've never stopped. I did it this morning at 4.20. It's changed my life. It's changed my life. When I get up, it's the, when first, I get up, it's the first thing I do is every single morning, seven days a week. I'm teaching it to my child. I'm teaching it to my child. And I said the other day to a bunch of students, I said, that's so interesting in the world. It's so interesting in the world. Um, we want to be seen. We want people to no see us. How much you no matter how much you need just to give, giving is quite a selfish thing because you feel so good about yourself. That should give. That should. It's, just selfish. it's, it's more selfish because when you give, you get so much back. You get so much back. But we want to be seen, but we want to be seen as well. But we're not willing to see ourselves. And I remember when I looked at myself in the mirror the first time because my mother blushes. She said she's five. She still blushes. So she gave me this thing. So I now and again when I get embarrassed, I go red in my face. And um, I looked myself in the eyes. I looked myself in the eyes, and I said, "You're amazing." And then I come into the and I blush. And I thought, so interesting. And I thought that's so interesting. I'm in the hotel marking it. Seven star, seven star resort. I'm so uncomfortable. I'm so uncomfortable with myself that in the bathroom, with myself, I can't look myself in the eyes. And I started fixing that that day. And I just think it's a wonderful. And I just think it's a wonderful tool, but it needs severe discipline because it only starts working after about. Yeah, it starts unraveling. It starts unraveling all those preconceived imprints, imprints on us, which we all have, if we are which, which all children have. And I think, I think education. I think education's duty is to unlock the potential children. of children. And, and, I think there's and, and I think there's many more ways than just to, for them to to be able to to live up to, to, to live up to the current matrixes. Um, matrixes. And on that note, thank you very much for your time, and thanks for your time. So apparently, so apparently, this is very interesting. Adults, 
An adult child, no, a child asks 126 questions on average per day. An adult. And an adult, only seven. Only seven. <laughs> so there's 119 <laughs> questions difference between us and children. So I'm interested in this because I work in a creative environment where so people are so insecure so because so you, so you wear your heart and your sleeve. And I'm trying to condition them just to be able to say anything whenever with safety. So when I, when, I, when I speak about killing majority of young little kids, they go like, what do you do with the poo? And they, they come up with the most spectacular questions. But so just, so just it's, 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 it's something to be aware of. We should coach people to, to just, not for now, because I don't have any answers, but I'm telling you in general. That's what's Thank you. Could you, could you explain more fully the, the project one school at a time? So, another yes. Another yes. So, so there's two people at the heart of one school. There's myself and Bronwyn. We created it together. We created it We've got two different visions. Visions. My original intention. So, I would like to overall. Um, the educational system of, the educational system of South Africa. That, that's been given to me as a duty. Ten years ago, which is why, Ten years ago, which is why I changed my life. It was like a thing. And I realized, and I realized, and I realized that um, it's going to be quite a journey. So I put a 25 year old man in place. I was very I confused. I, I couldn't see the night because it was given as such a duty that I would wake up in a pool of sweat. And, and then our strategist, and my one business partner, Ron, said, just chill out. Why don't you start just. Chill out. Just start just it all happened simultaneously. We were doing a little age thing as well, so we started engaging at school level. We weren't aware of the state of, of township schools, probably the 85%, 22,000 schools in South Africa. And I think we were just compelled. So it happened all at the same time. We started with one school in Soweto, and in Thompsonville, called Forte High. And it soon became apparent, soon became apparent to get some full time. So Brandon stepped out of her day job and became full time managing director of it. And we engage um, with the means available to us as much as possible. But over the years, there's been spectacular change in that school from when we started. Um, and mostly and most because the leadership got fixed at the top. So it's pretty much like a business. Um, we're doing what we can. We've got a second school in Dipslut now, but I think, but ideally, I would like to think Bronwyn is very fulfilled in her role. If I may speak to Bronwyn, or for her, or for her, because she's actively fulfilling her life purpose. Um, but for me, but for me, if I get there eventually, I would have some credibility to say I have been trying something for 20 years. But that's the intention. That's the intention. Well, thank you very much for sharing your last story. It's another hand, sorry. It's a example. Example. If you have a shiny, if you can be, if you were a minister of education in South Africa, what would you like to do? So, so. I've been thinking about that. I've been thinking about that. <laughs> I, I'm just putting it out there. I'm giving it in God's hands if that ever happened. I think my first thing, I think my first thing, I would find a greater purpose for the education department as it's a strategy in place of what we're wanting to achieve. That would be my first step. I really believe in a purposeful approach. I've seen what it's done for my business. It's just it's it's just completely ready to change it. And I think any government department is just like another business. So with the right with that level of clarity, maybe they could come change. I do believe that there's an opportunity to half academics, to somehow find a way, to somehow find a way that there's less academical subjects. In, I've not met one person. I'm, I find in tertiary you really get into specialising in subjects. I would rather focus on building self-esteem at school level. I don't, I don't figure out exactly how to do it, but but I would bring but I would bring in far more education around education around it. Purpose values. Um, 
things I've talked about today. The things I've talked about today, but not in the course of completely academia, because I see the power of that as well. If I was to build education just for me, which I now realized last weekend that we are so different as people, each of us is one in 30 million in terms of our strengths. We do the strength find and find an exercise at work. But if I did it just for me? But if I did it just for me, I will have three to four, three to four subjects for academia and four that's far more spiritually based. So overall so of all the curriculum. Well, thank you very much for sharing your life story with us. It was amazing to listen to, and I really enjoyed all the visuals. I think that got to our subconscious. Thank you. So, thank you. And I hope that you enjoyed the little gift that we've.